Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. <clears throat> a Poem Without an End by Yehuda Amichai, Shir Ein Sofi, translated from the Hebrew by Hannah Blach. Inside the brand new museum, there is an old synagogue. Inside the synagogue is me. Inside me, my heart. Inside my heart, a museum. Inside the museum, a synagogue. Inside it, me. Inside me, my heart. Inside my heart, a museum. It's a poem about living, breathing Judaism in the here and now. It's a poem about memorialized, destroyed Judaism, nearly forgotten Judaism. It's a poem about attachments and detachments, about being both inside and outside. It's about the Jewish heart's ability to draw near to the sacred, about our capacity for spiritual yearning, which is often followed by a stepping away for reasons conscious and unconscious, and then stepping in again, a little closer to the divine. It's like those stacking Russian dolls. This is how a Jew grows, Amichai teaches us, from the inside out. That's how the old Chelm story goes. A Jew doesn't grow from the bottom up or from the top down. A Jew grows from inside out. I hope, Serafina, you'll always remember that. A Jew grows from the inside out. Amichai's poem, Without an End, is a reenactment of the endless spiral of movement between the inner and the outer worlds of a Jew, of a Jew who walks through history. This has been a week laden with history. Aviv reminded us that it is the yard site of Ilan Ramon, and there have been enough headlines in the Jewish press and the mainstream press to make our heads spin. A heavy, strange week, with many of us still reeling from the aftershocks of the terrifying attack on Congregation Beth Israel in Colleyville, Texas, that dramatic and traumatic attack motivated by anti-Semitic tropes about Jewish power. Every day since then, it seems, has brought an undeniable evidence that anti-Semitism is indeed on the rise, undeniably. I know it is a deep concern to all of us here at Holy Blossom Temple, to Jews everywhere, and it must become of equal concern to all people of goodwill. History has demonstrate, demonstrated repeatedly that the horrors that can occur when people, when good people remain silent. That anti-Semitism cannot be fought by Jews alone, of course. All good people, the majority of people, must open its eyes and band together to eradicate hatred of all forms wherever it may be found. Some of these headlines. You know them, I'm sure you've been speaking about them at your own dinner tables, perhaps in your offices, or over Zoom. There is that so-called freedom convoy. What started off as a protest, mostly peaceful, and we must protect always the right to protest, it then twisted into something else. What do swastikas and Confederate flags have to do with vaccine mandates? And what in God's name are swastikas doing on our Canadian Parliament Hill? It is written in the Talmud, those who are in a position to reprove their fellow citizens and do not do so are held accountable for the sins of their city. And those who are in a position to reprove all humanity and do not do so are held accountable for the sins of the world entire. The swastikas flying at Parliament Hill must not be ignored. 
1,159 Canadians served in World War II to fight back Nazi tyranny. The hateful lawlessness we see this week is intended to de destabilize Canada's hard-won democracy. We must defend the right to protest. We must denounce the lawlessness and the hate. Also this week came the very strange news from McMinn County in Tennessee. Ironically, on International Holocaust Remembrance Day, the school board there voted unanimously to ban Mouse, Art Spiegelman's Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel about the Holocaust. It was pulled from the middle school curriculum, claiming that the book's profanity and one example of nudity of an animal, a cat, or a mouse, I'm not sure, to com combined, these things made it unfit for middle school students who have access to far worse on the internet. Book banning is inherently problematic, all the more so, strangely so, when we consider how the Nazis themselves employed this technique of burning books, banning books to further marginalize Jewish authors who were already considered to be other. This week, neo-Nazis marched in Orlando, Florida, a march with which the governor has refused to condemn. There were flyers across many states, coast to coast, with conspiracy theories about Jews being responsible for the pandemic. Less talked about, but very hurtful and dangerous, is the report that came on Tuesday from Amnesty International. The report labels Israel to be an apartheid state. While one can certainly criticize Israel's policies in the West Bank, the label is a form of demonization that crosses over the threshold into anti-Semitism. The reform movement's response to this report has made the, the case quite clearly. I'll read it in part to you now. We strongly reject the report produced by Amnesty International entitled Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians, Cruel System of Demonization and Crime Against Humanity. The report is replete with discredited and inaccurate allegations, including a deeply wrong accusation of apartheid. This report reflects Amnesty's inability to comprehend the history, context, and nuance of the situation in Israel and the Palestinian Authority, or the very real threats to Israel's survival and security that is, it has faced from its very founding. The report comes at a moment when Israel is making significant diplomatic progress with its Arab neighbors via the Abraham Accords and has seen the robust public political participation of its Arab Palestinian citizens who make up 20% of its population. The report also comes at a moment when anti-Semitism worldwide is rising, and we are deeply concerned that this report will encourage those who seek to fan its flames. Amnesty's failure to address Israel's legitimate security concerns and the very real genocidal threats it faces endanger the existence of the Jewish democratic state. As the largest religious and Zionist movement in Jewish life in North America, committed to Israel's Jewish as well as its democratic character, which must ensure the civil, political, and human rights of all its citizens, we, the reform leadership of North America, call on our governments in the U.S. and Canada to reject the central premise of this report and to continue the important work of fostering the conditions for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. If you have not read the articles about this report, if you have not studied the report itself, I urge you to do so. It is a worrisome trend. And then there's Whoopi. Dear, smart, thoughtful, sensitive Whoopi Goldberg. 
in that roundtable discussion over Mouse and the Tennessee School Board, we saw Whoopi share her belief that the Holocaust was not about race, but about man's inhumanity to man. And she doubled down on this when she was on the Stephen Colbert show. Any student of history knows that the Nazis considered Aryans to be racially superior and saw Jews and other ethnic groups as, an inferior, as inferior races, which had to be exterminated for the common good. Now, of course, the Jewish people is made up of many races. And I know we Jews ourselves debate, you know, are we a nationality? Are we an ethnicity? Are we a culture? Are we a religion? Are we a race? So it is confusing. I get that. And Whoopi Goldberg did apologize, both in writing and verbally. And I believe those apologies were sincere, as I believe her studies with Greenblatt from the Anti-Defamation anti League, I believe all of it was sincere and effective, actually. Think of all those audiences she has will now take note from this model of teshuva and learning and growth. And it does worry me that if someone of this caliber is so ignorant of what is still recent history, we have so much work to do. This week also marked the 20th yard site of Daniel Pearl. I love Hashalom. May peace be upon him. Daniel Pearl was the Wall Street journalist who was kidnapped and murdered while investigating Al Qaeda terrorism in Pakistan. His final words captured on video for all the world to see My name is Daniel Pearl. I'm a Jewish American from Encino, California, USA. My father's side of the family is Zionist. My father is Jewish. My mother is Jewish. I am Jewish. My family follows Judaism. We've made numerous family visits to Israel. Alav HaShalom. To abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power. Timothy Snyder writes on Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century, because there is no basis upon which to do so. If nothing is true, then all is spectacle. The biggest wallet pays for the most blinding lights. And this week was also Groundhog's Day. We lift up our heads and we see the long shadows. We see the long shadow of Jew hatred which continues. How is it possible? We have been here over and over and over again in every age. I've been thinking a lot about my grandparents since Colleyville how they worked so hard, even put their own bodies on the line to protect the Jewish people and to build up the Jewish state, they would be heartbroken to see what our people is facing today. So like that little groundhog, we admit that we have a ways to go now to reach the thaw of spring. The cold and the harsh reality of Jew hatred lingers far too long. When the rabbis reflect on this week's Torah portion, they notice the description of the gilding of the Ark, which held the Ten Commandments, both the whole tablets and the broken ones. And they notice a detail there saying that the gold must be on the outside of the Ark, and it must be also on the inside of the ark. So our sages ask, why gild the inside of the ark when no one could behold it, no one could be inspired by it? And they answer that it has something to teach each one of us 
that there must be gold on the outside and gold on the inside for each and every one of us, for every good person everywhere on the planet. What we put on the outside, whether the statements of a celebrity or the statements of a journalist or the statements of an elected official or the statements of a teacher or anyone who is in a position of influence, a boss, a neighbor. It must also be just as sincere in the inside of that person, in the heart of that person. What is said on the outside publicly must be internalized. And furthermore, the rabbis teach about this detail of the gilding on the inside as on the outside also comes to teach that what is on the inside, quietly, privately, personally, must also be made known and declared for all to understand. When we see, as we do all too often these days, the obscenity of anti-Semitism and all forms of xenophobia, we have to call it what it is. We know in our hearts it is wrong. We have to speak the truth loudly about its nature and hope that in doing so, others will accept this truth, this correction, this teshuva, and respond. Searching out, accepting, and embracing truth, especially a challenging one, can be painful. Yes, being exposed to the horrors of the Holocaust as a young teenager, it's hard for a person of any age, but to hide this truth is obscene. Calling out others for failing to see the truth of our experience can be uncomfortable, I know. But it is a discomfort that, we can, that can only lead to greater understanding when we share it. Confronting distorted truths, like in the Amnesty International report, these distorted truths and conspiracy theories that are increasingly broadly accepted and flooding the internet, confronting these distortions can be a lonely endeavor, I know but it is painfully necessary, whenever and wherever, whether it's easy or if it's hard. When we see the truth distorted, we must raise our voices. Inside the brand new museum, there is an old synagogue. Inside the synagogue is me, inside me, my heart.